Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the lecture entitled Insect Pest of Turf Grasses. We are getting this information directly from chapter three in your Ornamental and Turf Grass Pest Management Manual. Now, let's get started with our course objectives. We're gonna explain the difference between complete and gradual metamorphosis. We're gonna describe chinch buck damage to turf. We're gonna identify four pests that might cause root damage to turf. We're gonna explain how frequent mowing impacts fire ants. We're going to describe three ways to find turf insects in the soil. We're going to explain the role of traps in monitoring turf insects. And then we're going to describe four pest control problems caused by a thick thatch layer. We're going to describe three types of organisms used in biological control of turf insects. We're going to explain why some insecticide formulations should be watered in. And last but not least, we're going to explain why a granular formulation would be used on a site without irrigation. Now, guys, as always, I recommend reading the chapter prior to watching the lecture. So if you haven't read the chapter, chapter three, really good information please go and do that and then come back to the lecture. But let's go ahead and get started with our introduction. Guys, there are many insects that affect turf grasses, but most of the damage is only caused by a certain few. We're gonna look at those as we go through the lecture. Now, each one of these insects are gonna go through developmental stages. We have gradual metamorphosis and we have complete metamorphosis. And one way that I like to distinguish the difference between the two, gradual is the little babies look a lot like mom and dad. Complete metamorphosis, they look totally different. They don't look nothing like mom and dad as they go through these stages of development. And so let's look here at a butterfly. You have the eggs on the leaf, so let's start with the eggs. They're eggs on a leaf. They go to the caterpillar stage. Then they go to the pupa inside a cocoon. Then metamorphosis begins, the adult emerges, and voila, we have the adult butterfly. Now, butterflies, butterflies and things like moths are going to have their babies called the caterpillars. Things over here like in figure 3-1, um, the chinch bug is gonna go through the gradual metamorphosis and then you can see the little babies are mini me's. They look like mom and dad. Yes, they're tinier versions, but you can, you can distinguish them. Hey, that's, that comes from mom and dad there. This stuff here, without the scientific knowledge that we've known, we might think this is just being a worm, but now with the, the botanist and the biologist that's come up with all this and studied this, guys, we can figure out that a grub is the baby of the Jap beetle. We can figure out that the caterpillar is either gonna be a butterfly or a moth. So we can actually determine, start determine a lot earlier what insects uh, are causing our turf grass damage. But two good pictures that are in our textbook. So study those, study those. Um, the gradual metamorphosis, the babies are called nymphs. And then in complete metamorphosis, they are called pupa. So uh, good way uh, to remember that we got looks like mom and dad and doesn't look like mom and dad when it comes to um, their developmental stages that they go through. So we first need to identify insect pests and we're going to first talk about we're going to first talk about the cutworm, the army worm and the bill bug. Very, very cool individuals. Uh, in their own little worlds. And so here we have the cutworm. We have a black cutworm and we have a bronze uh, cutworm. Guys, they're gonna live in burrows in the lawn. They're gonna live like in aeration holes. So, you know, we plug and see, they're gonna find those holes uh, and that's where they're gonna hang out at. They're gonna come out during the night, they're gonna clip the bottom of the turf. Um, in the golf course industry, the threshold is very low for this. You know, maybe one to two larvae per square foot. Other places, we're gonna be okay with three to eight per square foot uh, for the cutworm. Um, their life cycle, um, they spend the winter as larvae in the soil under the turf. When the spring gets here, they feed on the grass leaves. Once they're fully grown, they dig back into the soil again to molt into the pupal stage. They emerge from the pupa as adult moths. The, uh, the black cutworm will have a couple generations per year. The bronze only has one. 
the new moths will feed on the flower petal and then they will mate at night. Females will lay up to 300 eggs uh, at a time. Predators often eat most of these eggs, uh, but in golf course teas and greens uh, where they use a lot of pesticides, this doesn't really happen because those natural pests have been eliminated. Remember the, uh, the lecture, natural pest controls, uh, just from the high use of insecticides, they've killed the, uh, the natural predators for this. Um, I'm just trying to think anything else I might want to say about these guys. Yeah, I think it's pretty neat that they that they kind of hang out in the holes or the burrows. Um, that's going to actually cause brown circles or streaks in your lawn. So uh, it would be cool to actually go out and kind of collect these things uh, during this class. But I think uh, most of you guys do that in insects and disease. Our army worm hear about this all the time, you know, guys that do a lot of hydro seeding and stuff like that. Um, but the fall army worm, and then there's a yellow striped army worm. Uh, they're more commonly found in the southern and transition turf zones. They uh, sometimes feed together and they'll actually mow the lawn, actually kind of just, you know, mow it in a, uh, in a pattern, uh, start to finish. They do not burrow uh, into the thatch or the soil during the day. Their life cycle, the army worm has continuous generations uh, during the year and develop merely uh, slows down during the cooler winter months. Um, see these all the time, actually see the adult uh, all the time. Uh, you'll see them a lot like right before daybreak and stuff. See a lot of these like, you know, when you're actually mowing these guys coming up, um, but can really damage, uh, do a lot of damage uh, two turf grass guys. The bill bug. We got the blue grass, or we got the bluegrass bill bug, and that's mainly going to find it in our cool season grasses. We have the hunting or the zoysia bill bug, uh, which is more uh, common in the transition zones or where we have warm season uh, grasses. Uh, but they can attack, you know, attack all types. They bore into the stems of the grasses, so they can actually like cut out that hole you'll actually it almost looks like a straw um, and they'll hang out in there until they get too big where they where they can't uh, it's easy to their damage is easy to diagnose by grabbing hold of the dead uh, turf and pulling it up if the stems break off easy at the ground level um, look at the broken edges they will leave those hollow straw like uh, structures and then you're going to see all this sawdust looking material that we call frass um, there is no thresholds for the bill bugs. They have a single generation per year. Uh, they lay their eggs in the grass stems in early spring. They're going to hatch uh, and feed in the turf through early July. So we're probably going to start seeing those out now. Um, the new adults emerge mid-July through August. The hunting bill bug uh, will appear to have one major generation per year. But both adults and grubs remain active. Uh, throughout the summer. Uh, it's identified by a distinct brown head. Uh, adults are around three-eighths of an inch long, black to reddish brown, and usually they are covered uh, in soil. Pests that discolor our leaves and stems. Uh, and here is the chinch bug. You know, we looked at that in figure 3-1, uh, but with our chinch bug, the hairy chinch bug, um, they're small, about a, f um, about a fifth of an inch. They're black and white bugs with sucking mouth parts. They are associated mainly with cool season grasses, especially fine fescues and perennial ryegrass. The southern chinch bug does not survive the heavy freezes here in the triad, but most commonly associated with Bermuda grass and the St. Augustine grass. Uh, most of them have become resistant to common insecticides, so we've got to change it up. They feed in clusters, so damage first appears as like clusters of circles or patches of yellowing turf uh, that resemble drought injury. And so you may, I mean, guys, the one way to figure this out is just to actually, you know, you have to do the site visits and you have to, you really, you're going to have to get down on your hands and knees. You're going to have to pull back the turf. You're going to actually have to look and, and make sure that it is not 
a disease or that it is not a cultural issue such as um, low water or too much water. You gotta get down there and do that. One way to find out with these chinch bugs, and we'll look at this towards the end of the lecture, is using the flotation technique. Um, Cause these things will actually float. You take like a old tin coffee can, um, the top's open and the bottom's open. You fill it full of water and these things are gonna float to the top. Um, usually their threshold, you know, we can withstand about 15 to 20 per square feet uh, of these guys. And that, I mean, really start thinking that's um, quite a bit. But, you know, a fifth of an inch long, uh, they're going to be little guys uh, that are out there. And as you can see here, um, the chinch bug having gradual metamorphosis. Again, they resemble mom and dad uh, quite a bit. Pests that feed on the roots. Our grubs, we have our Japanese beetle, the green June beetle, the mast chafer, uh, and the mole cricket. Some of the ugliest looking little guys you'll see is that mole cricket. But the Japanese beetle, ladies and gentlemen, probably one of the coolest insects to collect when you are a child. Um, I remember, you know, collecting these and playing with them as a kid. They are detrimental to our roses, and when they are in the larva, larvae stage, they are detrimental to our turf grasses. But they, uh, when shine, you know, when they're adults, they're shiny green with that copper-colored wing. Um, the whitish grubs, they're going to be C-shaped. That's one way to identify them. They look like a C, and they are about one inch long. And the head is a yellowish brown. When there are heavy infestations in the turf, you're, um, uh, it's going to resemble, you know, dry patches in the lawn. It's going to die out. Um, you're going to be able to pick the grass up real easy. Uh, it's just kind of a nasty infestation to have these guys. Uh, and their life cycle, man, they emerge from the ground mid-June through July. Uh, you're going to see them congregate on trees, especially fruit trees. That's when they're going to eat uh, the most. And they're going to go to your roses and things of that nature. And they're, basically what they're doing is going out to eat and they're, they're hooking up. They are mating and they are having a good old time this time of year. Then the females will dig into the turf and she's going to lay groups of eggs. They're going to hatch in about nine, nine to 30 days, um, depending on the temperature and moisture. They will feed until cold temperature signal the time to dig into the soil for overwintering. And then when it... The soil warms up, you know, late, late spring. They're going to rise to the surface to finish feeding. And then they will uh, dig down into the soil and form that, that pupil where it takes two to three weeks um, to, to develop into the gorgeous green coppered bug that we see here. Um, but a, a good money maker uh, in the lawn care industry guys you know we're always hearing about grub control but here is the life stages for it again this is complete metamorphosis uh does not look like mom and dad starts out at the egg then it has the first second and third instar um, and we described it having that yellowish head as you can see there on the the big c-shaped one inch long and then it's into the pupa and then finally into the adult stage uh, of the jet beetle and as we talked about uh, you know laying the eggs they're going to feed then they're going to dig down when it gets a little colder then it's going to warm up uh, over here on the the left hand side it starts warming up mid, you know mid to late april they're going to rise to the surface they're going to start feeding and then they're going to develop into uh, that last stage before emerging as an adult and again, they're going to go and hang out, munch, and date, and actually make more babies for us to take care of. Our green June beetle does not eat the grass roots, guys. They emerge from a central burrow at night to feed on the thatch or manure. So you're going to see a lot of eggs get laid underneath cattle uh, droppings out in pastures. You will see that. Um, 
They are going to loosen up the soil. They're going to have those miniature tunnels that you're going to see in, in, in your customers' yards. And once they're on the surface, the grubs will crawl on their backs. Uh, as you can see here on the, the picture of the right, that's a nasty uh, looking little bug there. During the summer, they're going to feed on ripe fruits and saps from wounds in the trees. Uh, their life cycle, the females lay their eggs in turf or under the livestock manure, and then they emerge to feed on organic matter, and then they pupate underground. You know, they're an inch and a half long. You know, they're a little bit bigger than the Japanese beetle. The head and brown spots with, uh, with a brown head and brown spots along the body is your green June beetle. And as you can see here, you know, compared to the size of a penny, the green June beetle is a lot larger than the Japanese beetle. And thanks to Mr. Gutierrez uh, for this picture. All right, the mask Schaefer. And if you've seen one of my Instagram posts I put up about the, uh, the mast Schaefer, um, there you can see on the right is a picture of their larvae. And then you can see here they are actually uh, uh, hanging out and trying to produce more mask Schaefer's. But turf heavily infested with the mask Schaefer's shows a drought stress, yes. And then you will see dead patches uh, that are not going to recover uh, with water applications. Irrigation is not going to do anything for it. Uh, wildlife will often dig around the dead patches and moles sometimes tunnel where the grub populations are high. They're eating on these little guys. Um, the turf is going to feel spongy and will lift easily. And then uh, the adults are often mistaken for May or June beetles. Life cycles. The adult beetles emerge from the turf mid-June to mid-July this time of year. Each night, the females come out to the surface, release a pheromone or sex attractant odor, and then they're going to mate. After mating, the females may dig back into the turf or fly a short distance and dig into the soil. Mass shaper adults do not feed, and they only fly at night. So they're out trying to make more babies. Their whole job is to eat and make more little babies. But... Um, um, one of the uh, one of the insects that you can actually go out and probably find in your yard right now. They're half an inch long. Um, it is that light brown color which I identifies them. And here is the mole cricket, one of the nastiest looking little guys that we can find in our yard. We have the tawny mole cricket, and then we have the southern mole cricket. The tawny is only going to eat the uh, the grass, but you might see some of the uh, the southern mole crickets uh, munching on other insects. That is one nasty looking grub there to the right. Uh, it's got that reddish brown head. Um, the tawny and the southern mole crickets, they mainly affect um, warm season grasses in the southern states. The to manage these mole crickets, guys, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to track them. You're gonna have to get you're gonna have to monitor. You're gonna have to keep up with what's going on in the soil. Um, if you see adult tunneling, that's a good indicator where the nymphs are likely to occur and where insecticides should be applied for these guys. Uh, the best time to treat is after all the eggs have hatched. Uh, which is generally mid-June to early July. Again, this time of year, it depends on the location, life cycle. Uh, over most of their range, the mole crickets spend their winter months as adults and nearly mature nymphs. Heavy flights often occur after warm spring rains. The females are going to dig 3 to 10 inches into the soil and lay several clutches of eggs over several weeks. Uh, young nymphs are common in late May through June. They will molt six to eight times over the summer and most mature by the end of October. The new adults may dig deep into the soil during the dry or cool conditions. But a nasty looking creature in itself and on page 39 in your textbook has good um, information about them. The red imported fire ant guys, um, you know, people are allergic to these things. They can get bit by these and they can uh, have a reaction to them. They're, uh, they're kind of dangerous. They build mounds in open areas or near stumps or other objects. Uh, you can also find them underneath buildings. Um, 
you know, what's cool about this thing is, um, you know, six of these guys in the queen can actually start a new colony uh, several hundred feet away from the original original colony. They and these workers, they're you know they're going to live about five weeks. You got the queen that can live up to seven years. Um, the males that you see on page 40 in your textbook, these guys are going to, uh, they're going to pass away, you know, soon after mating. Uh, but that queen, she can live up to seven years. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a cool, cool way for survival. I mean, they've got it pat down. Um, you know, they've got it down to a science. I mean, no, nobody... I'm just thinking, if, you know, if there's any time in history that we may have, you know, acted like ants. I mean, everything's about saving the colony and saving the queen, and, you know, with the worker ants and then the uh, the, the males that actually mate uh, to reproduce. And, you know, the, the workers are so small compared to the queen and the, the, the male maters. Um, but one way to take care of these guys is to mow, you know, a cultural control. Um, golf courses are going to mow their greens, um, you know, seven times a week. You know, tee boxes and the fairways are going to get cut about three times. So that's reducing the, um, the fire ants on the golf courses. They may have to do uh, spot treatments only on their roughs. Chemical control, they're going to use baits, dust, but they're going to have to be watered in uh, for them. There's also granules, granules drenched with water after an application, liquid drenches. Uh, or even aerosol injections can be used for uh, the imported fire ant. Um, again, these worker ants, guys, they feed the queen and they're going to protect her. Um, mating flights, are, you're going to see them happen in the spring and fall after, in the afternoon, uh, soon, you know, right after a, a rainy period. Again, the males die right after mating. The mature queen will lay up to 800 eggs a day. The average con colony contain up to 100,000 to half a million workers and up to several hundred uh, winged ants and queens. So they are taking care of the colony. And figure 312, you know, guys, as you can look at the sizes, you know, we've got the, the male who's a little bit smaller than the queen. And then we've got the, uh, the three types of workers, the major, minor, and the the minimum, but when we say hard workers, they're hard workers. All right, so finding the pest, guys, we're gonna have to scout, we're gonna have to sample, and we're gonna have to monitor. And as you can see here, you know, pulling back the turf and actually finding the grubs uh, in the turf. And an arrow is drawn to each one of them. Um, so when you're scout, you're gonna have to identify them, you may have to pull a sample. Um, and then you're going to have to go back and monitor it. And you're going to have to monitor even after your treatments for, for these little guys. Different ways to find them. We talked about the, um, uh, the soap and water flush and the flotation. Here we have uh, a can here that we're collecting the chinch bugs. And that is the flotation device where we're taking that coffee can. We're cutting the bottom of it off. We're sticking it down into the ground and we're actually filling it full of water and these chinch bugs are gonna float up to the top. And as you can see, the white arrows um, are pointing to each one of them. There's also a soap and water flesh, uh, flush, sorry, which we can um, get with our mole crickets, army worms, and caterpillars. We're putting about two ounces of dishwashing detergent in four gallons of water. We're pouring it in a square yard of turf and where we suspect that, th that these guys are hanging out in, and these guys will be irritated by the, the detergent and they will come to the surface and we can count and see how many we have. So we're using these tests, bring them to the surface, counting, and then to determine our threshold for our customers or for our own personal property. Here we have a pitfall trap and um, bill bugs are used for that. These guys are going to fall right into it. Uh, that's how you monitor it, just sticking a 16-ounce cup, uh, burying it to the rim, and then putting a little edge of Vaseline 
uh, around the top. That'll keep them in the cup. And then we can go back and actually count them. That is the pitfall trap. And then we have the pheromone trap. Be careful with the pheromone trap, guys, because you release a pheromone, you may uh, attract a lot more of the uh, the insect when doing that. And then we have the light trap. And the light traps are going to attract, you know, moths of the cutworms and many of the other night flying beetles. But they'll come into that light, and we can actually catch them um, uh, with that. But that pheromone trap, again, be careful because uh, um, you'll attract far more beetles uh, than you want when you release that pheromone. Cultural control. We've got thatch. You know, here's a good layer of thatch right there for, uh, for that piece of turf grass. Um, we got to keep our thatch in control. So we need to, to run over it with a dethatcher. Uh, we need to aerate uh, our lawn because, guys, a good, thick, healthy lawn is one way to keep the pest out. Uh, with this thatch, guys, it um, keeping that thatch below a half inch, guys, has several benefits for our pest management. And going back to our IPM program, it reduces winter shelter for many pests so they don't have any warmth there. They're kind of exposed. It also creates a more uniform humidity zone for cutworms and chinch bugs. So the thinner thatch will allow the surface to dry out. And so these guys aren't gonna hang out there. Uh, billbug larvae and sometimes white grubs will feed on the thatch. It hinders the movement of biological controls and pesticides down to the soil. And a matted thatch may prevent irrigation or rainwater from fully reaching the soil and will keep out the water that is necessary to wet in certain pesticides. So you've got to, you've got to remove that thatch and you have to go out and take a core plug like this and determine whether or not how much is, you know, half an inch is good, but anything more than that, we don't want to use it. So um, inspect for thatch, get rid of it, use resistant cultivars uh, and pests. You know, if you're using, if you have a chance to put in a new sod installation or a new type of turf grass, you would want to use a resistant cultivar to the pest. You don't want to, you don't want to install something that's susceptible uh, to insect damage. Um, so use the most resistant cultivars that you can find. Most perennial ryegrasses and tall fescues contain an endophyte, which is a fungus that will live in the plant and will actually harm the insects and can actually kill chinch bugs, bill bugs, and even turf caterpillars. Your biological control. We have predators, parasites, pathogens. Um, you know, in part of parasites, we should be talking about peritosoids, but you know, with the predators, guys, um, you know, they're going to actually eat and feast on the, uh, the insects. They actively seek out their prey and attack them. So we have predators such like the big eyed bugs, ear wings, lace wings, ground beetles, lady beetles, and rove beetles. They feed on the various insects and eggs that, that we can uh, see in our yards. Um, parasites, we have the, the wasps, we have the nematodes. Um, and actually, you know, those are the protozoids because they're actually you know, laying their eggs inside. You know, here we see a wasp laying the eggs inside of an aphid, but, you know, your book also talks about the nematodes that actually kill, um, kill their host and actually crawl up inside of it, you know, for, for protection, uh, which is a cool way uh, to get rid of them. You know, there's, you know, several, several, books and degrees and stuff that you can get in nematodes guys that actually help get rid of these um, nasty pests uh, in in our soils and then we have pathogens you know we have bt that we can uh, you know use to get rid of many caterpillars and then we have the milky spore disease which will actually help get rid of of our grub control for the japanese beetle up to 20 years uh, in our yard when we apply it um, irrigation, guys, we're going to have to irrigate some of our chemicals into the, uh, to the ground, but you need to read the label again. Label is the law uh, and see if the insecticide should be watered in. In general, most of them targeted for chinch bugs, green bugs, mites, and sod webworms should be on the leaf surface or on the top layers and should not be watered in. 
Most soil insecticides for the control of white grubs or build bugs need to get as far into the soil as they can, so we would apply water until the top inch of soil under the thatch is wet. When the soil is dry, insects like white grubs, mole crickets burrow deeper into the soil and are harder to control, so we need to irrigate prior to applying the pesticide so they will rise to the top and then we can apply the pesticide which they will be in contact with. Uh, granular formulations must be rained on or irrigated to activate the pesticide, but granular formulations are often preferred where you can't irrigate because granulars will last longer than the liquid formulations while waiting for the rain. And that concludes chapter three, guys. This is in your North Carolina Ornamental and Turfgrass Pest Management Manual. I appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thanks.